what have we got up for today? So, um, Zachary, probably even a Mai Tai. And as a consequence, I'm going to make you a couple of Mai Tais this evening because I want some practice making Mai Tais and deciding which way I want to go. Um, so that's unusual. Um, let's see, what else is unusual? Star, would you get me the, the newest edition? Yes, so we did, uh, I like to keep you appraised of the new things that uh, come into the tiki life that, did, that we lead here. So this is the new one. This is yet another of my Cthulhu mugs. Yep. And uh, so there's a straw hole in the back here, right there. Comes out through the wings. And I, well, so Pooch, where do you put in alcohol to this guy? Oh, by the way, this is from Stormcrow, which is a bar in Canada that I have not yet had the opportunity to go to. Someday there will be travel again. And uh, just in case you, wa you wanted nightmares, here you go. Here's a disembodied Cthulhu head. Ah! And that's how you get the drink in there is that. Which, uh, when you don't know that the head comes off, it's a little disturbing when you pick up the mug and the head just falls off. You're like, oh my gosh, I broke it. But no, it's actually very cool. Um, I'm going to take this out. Set this guy right here. And he does actually stay pretty well. So that's kind of cool. So that's the latest addition there. We have a uh, yet another Cthulhu mug. All right, so he's going to go over here, keep an eye on us, keep an eye on you guys. He and I are old friends. All right. You've got seven people. I don't know who they are. <laughs> Star says, we, I, you have seven people. I don't know who they are. Well, oh, oh, okay. So um, seven sounds like a fine number to start with. So um, like I said uh, earlier, I've got to get some practice making my ties. And there is no more quintessential tiki drink than the Mai Tai. There is legend, there is lore around the Mai Tai, there is rum geekery around the Mai Tai, and uh, we're going to engage in just a, a minute fraction of that. So um, the original Mai Tai uh, made use of a rum uh, from Jamaica, uh, the Rayan nephew 17-year-old rum. And uh, by all accounts, it's an amazing rum. And when uh, they could no longer get the Ray and Nephew 17, they dropped down to the Ray and Nephew 15. Um, and in this case, yes, it did mean 17 years and 15 years uh, aging. So these are in the tropics. Imagine, you know, the angel share that's being lost to produce these rums. So they were very, very complex, highly mature rums. And then the 15 year went away. And so you couldn't make the Mai Tai according to the original sorts of recipes and have the original flavors. But uh, there have been occasional bottles found of the Ray and Nephew 17, and people have tasted these and have tried to come up with uh, either combinations of rum or have blended a rum and bottled that rum in order for it to be as close to that Ray and Nephew 17 as possible. So what I'm going to do for you today is we're going to do two different... Mai Tais. They are exactly the same except for the rums that are going in them. In one case, we are going to go with what is sort of a tried and true Mai Tai recipe. Um, that recipe has two ounces of rum in it, and the tried and true method of getting something close to the Ray and Nephew 17 is by mixing a little Jamaican rum. In this case, we're going to go with the Appleton Estate and a little rum agricole, aged rum agricole, and here we're going to go with the Clement Select Barrel. All right, so we're going to go equal portions of that. But remember I said that some people have tried to create a blend that would recreate the flavors of the Ray and Nephew 17. Well, one of those is the Plantation Jamaican Rum, the, uh, begins with an X, Xmaca, Jamaica, whatever, however it's pronounced, nobody seems to know. But this is 100% pot still rum, and it was blended in order to yield something that is close to that traditional uh, Rain Nephew 17. So we are going to make uh, one Mai Tai using this, and one Mai Tai using a combination of this, and we will see which one we like better. We'll go with that. All right, so what actually is in a Mai Tai? So lime juice, uh, a spiced or cinnamon syrup or um, 
Martin Cade out of Smuggler's Cove has a custom spice blend that he uses for his syrup that he calls a Mai Tai syrup. Um, there's the rum, obviously, and there's orange curacao, which I have right here. Okay, so what are we going to do? All right, well, we are going to start. We've got Pam saying she's looking forward. She's never had a Mai Tai. Never had a Mai Tai? How is that possible? Okay. And Kathy, as in Kathy and Hughes, so is waiting. Excellent, excellent. We can do this. All right. So first of all, we need three quarters of an ounce of lime juice. Lime juice. We're gonna go three quarters ounce each of these. So there's three quarters and another three quarters. So much for the lime juice. Okay, the orange curacao, which I put right here, uh, half ounce. You know, I believe I left off one of the most important ingredients in the Mai Tai and one which sometimes stymies folks from making these guys at home, which is orgeat. Uh, so you need to have to have some orgeat on hand in order to make a Mai Tai. That's okay, because as you may have noticed, I tend to have orgeat lying around. Okay, so now we need a quarter ounce of a spiced syrup. Here's my homemade brand of spice syrup. So this has got cloves and cinnamon and allspice and a little cardamom in it. And we're only going quarter ounce here. So not much at all. There. And there. Vince and Nancy are here. Excellent. Hi, Vince. Hey, Nancy. Hmm. Orjat. We're going to go, so this is a standard almond orgeat, not like the pistachio orgeat I was using last week. Um, and we're going to go with, what is it, quarter ounce? Quarter ounce. Quarter ounce of orgeat. Now, if I were smart, I would have done the orgeat first, because orgeat tends to be a little thicker. And so when you put in the other ingredients on top of the orgeat in your jigger, it tends to clear out the jigger a little better. Here we're going to have a little sticking of the ore shot to the jigger. It's all right. It'll come out in the end. Now the rums. So we need two ounces of rum. In one case, we're going to go with the Jamaica. If I can get the top off of it. There we go. So two ounces. Right here. Do, 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 do. I'm going to need me another bottle of this soon. This is some tasty stuff. And then for the other one, we're going to go one ounce of the Clement. So it's a rum agricole. So this is made straight from sugarcane juice. And then we're going to use the Appleton Estate. And the Appleton Estate is, of course, made, like most rum on the planet, from molasses. All right. Now, one of the tricky things about the Mai Tai is you're like, so, Pooch, this doesn't sound anything like any of the Mai Tais I've ever had before. That's because the Mai Tai became sort of the signature flagship drink for Tiki. And so everybody and their brother... Uh, including places like Chili's and TGI Friday's, did custom versions of the Mai Tai that bear little or no resemblance to the original Mai Tai. But because they want to be known as Tiki, they're calling their drink a Mai Tai. Notice there's nothing red in here. If your Mai Tai is red, it's not a true Mai Tai. <laughs> it's something else. Brooke wants to know the rums again. Uh, Brooke wants to know the rums. Okay, so on the left, we have the plantation... Uh, Jamaican style Zamaica, X-A-Y-M-A-C-A. -A -A. It's 100% pot still rum. This was blended to taste like the rum that should be in a Mai Tai. On the other hand, we're splitting the rum, one ounce each of Clement, a rum agricole. Clement, rum agricole. And the Appleton Estate. Here we're using the uh, reserve blend as opposed to using you know, the 12 year or something along those lines. 
which would make a better Mai Tai, right? No kidding, but... Susie said she liked apple cream Susie Casey. Excellent, excellent. Uh, you know, one of the last times I had a Mai Tai in a restaurant was with Susie at... Was it Tony's on the pier or something like that when I was in Redondo Beach a couple of years back? I tend to make Mai Tais at home rather than have them while I'm out. Okay, so uh, we need ice in here. Um, these are both going to be shaken, and oddly enough, there's a combination of crushed and cube ice that's going to go in these. So here we're going to uh, get a little bit of uh, crushed ice in here. My scoop's in the back, and I'm tethered once again, so I'm not going to go in the back and get my scoop. Just going to use a cocktail tin for this. All right, so there's some crushed ice. That goes here, and then a couple of cubes. There's one, two, three, that'll be fine. One, two, three, that'll be fine. Why am I mixing ice? Um, it gives you a different quality of aeration and a different quality of dilution. Um, so if you used all crushed ice, this would be a little more diluted than what you'd want. And if you used all cube ice, it wouldn't have the same level of dilution that you want. So we're going to lid that up. Lid that up. Tap these down. I'm going to do a double shake. Now, very important, uh, something I had to learn almost the hard way. Uh, so you'll note the way I'm going to shake these is this way. So the open portion of the container, the bottom portion, is facing me. That's because if the seal breaks, you want the drink going on you, the bartender, and not the patron, not the person that is patiently waiting for the drink. All right, so here we're going to do a shake. All right, good and icy. Oh, there's even steam coming off these guys. That tells me the humidity is way up. And these are going to go straight into the double rocks glasses, also known as Mai Tai glasses. No straining, nothing. So that goes there. Back is there. All right. And now the classic garnish for a Mai Tai. Oh, by the way, the reason the wash line is different on these is just because of the different size glasses, same amount of liquid in each. So is a classic hollowed out lime. So that'll go right there. That'll go right there. And mint, coarse mint. So I reach in here, grab a little mint. Smack that puppy so that we get a little aromatics off of it. There's some mint. A little garnish game going on here. We'll do the same on the other side. Um, worthwhile pointing out, this mint looked terrible an hour and a half ago. It was all wilted and nasty. So I cut the stems, shoved it in an ice bath, and it's been sitting here for like an hour and it is sparked up, looks really nice, smells very good. And what we have here are two Mai Tais. So I'm gonna stick a straw in each, give these a taste. Charity says hi. Hi, Charity. All right, so here's the plantation. Quality. That's good. I want to know her opinion before I offer mine. This one tastes like there's no booze in it. <laughs> That's dangerous. Um, I think there's actually a little more complexity based on the two rums that are there. Um, while I really like the plantation rum, um, I, I think this just makes a the, splitting the the rums here gives a uh, just a little slightly more complex flavor to this. So once again, uh, so what we have is lime juice, uh, a spiced syrup, 
In this case, I'm using a two to one Demerara uh, syrup with some allspice and clove and cinnamon, that sort of thing in it. A uh, quarter ounce of orgeat, a half ounce of orange curacao, and then two ounces of rum. Now, the nice thing about this is uh, nobody that I know of actually knows what the Ray and Nephew 17 is supposed to taste like. So feel free, play around with your rums, find a Mai Tai that you like. Um, Star took the other one. Um, so I'm gonna be happy with this one. Yeah, I'm liking that. Dave Vogel did not know that about mint. Ah, so that's... Um, you can rejuvenate it. You can also do that with um, celery and lettuce. Yeah, uh, you just stick it in ice bath and uh, wilted lettuce will perk right up in like half an hour, 40 minutes. And then you can, you know, rip the leaves off, put them on sandwiches, that sort of thing. Get nice crisp lettuce again. All right, the uh, Mai Tai. There you go. There's two examples of the Mai Tai. Um, now, you can, of course, adulterate a Mai Tai in any number of different ways, but that is, that is the classic Mai Tai. Anne asked a stupid question. There, there are stupid questions, but I'm guessing Anne didn't ask one of them. So what is the quote-unquote stupid question that Anne is asking? So which is better, purchased or shot syrup or homemade? Um, well, so I think that probably depends upon the skill of who's making the orjat. Anne's made orjat. Anne is made orjat. Um, have I, I don't think I've tasted Anne's orjat though. Um, so I have used uh, BG Reynolds orjat. I have used Tarani almond syrup in place of orjat. I have used small hands orjat, all purchased versions of orjat. Um, for my money, the homemade orjat that I use um, has uh, just a heavier almond flavor to it, and the mouthfeel is very different. It adds uh, a thickness and consistency and mouthfeel to the drink that you don't get from the commercial brands. That said, uh, the commercial brands will keep forever, and uh, homemade orjat doesn't. Now, it keeps a long time, um, but it doesn't keep forever, uh, especially if you, if you keep it refrigerated, it will last you a good long while. Um, give you an example. Here is shot glass. And I will pour some of the, I will shake the orjat because it does separate. Pour some into glass. I don't know if you can see that, but the it's just got a thicker consistency to it. I know people that make orgeat from like almond milk, uh, and it just doesn't quite have the same consistency to me. But yeah, you can coat the inside of the glass with this. It's thick enough to do that. And that's, for me, the big difference between using a homemade orgeat um, and the flavor's better. It just is. Homemade. Go homemade. Just take your time, do it right. Okay, um, Mai Tais. Um, I'd like to make a drink request. Is there a place to request that? Um, right here, I'll pass it on. Right here, uh, Star will pass on the drink request uh, to me. Um, I will attempt to do that or, or to comply. We'll see how it goes. Um, I do have a couple of other things I'm gonna do for you this evening. Um, one of these is a home creation um, that is uh, debuted in last year's Tiki Party, I believe. Yeah, last year's, well, last year's Haunted Tiki Party, which had a uh, Lovecraftian theme to it, um, as they always do. And so I wanted to do a drink that was Lovecraftian themed, um, and I created a drink that I call the Elder Sign. And so I'm going to do that for you uh, this evening. So um, I'm going to need a, another shaker tin. I'm going to use a mixing tin for this. Assuming I can get this to lid up properly. Yeah, I can do that. All right. So what is in the Elder Sign? So the Elder Sign, um, it's... The Elder Sign in Lovecraft literature is the symbol that locks away the Elder Ones. It's very powerful. 
Um, it is something that should be hunted down um, and treasured by those that can find it because of its power. So um, as a consequence, I use a fair number of things in the Elder Sign that are particular to this drink and are things that you're just not likely to have on the bar uh, in most cases. But I happen to have them. I'm going to use them because I like the way the drink comes out. All right, first up is the um, plantation jicama, jicama, Jamaica, however that is pronounced, uh, rum. So we are going to go with, uh, actually I should do this backwards. I should do the, um, the general rule. Always put the cheapest ingredients in first. That way if you mess something up, you're not messing up your expensive ingredients. They should go in last. So we're going to start from the bottom of my list and work my way up. So this is a half ounce of lime juice. So half ounce of lime juice. I warn you, this is not one of those drinks that only has two or three ingredients. There are several ingredients here. Okay, so half ounce lime juice. Also a half ounce of fresh squeezed lemon juice. I like the blend of lime and lemon. Um, the lemon seems to be more pronounced on the front end and fades a little bit. The lime gives you that sourness that runs through the, the feel of the drink, through the entire tasting of the drink. Okay, now we can go to the rums because that's what we're going to put in in terms of cheap, cheap ingredients. So first of all, one ounce of the plantation Jamaican rum. Oop, there we go. Next up. Okay, here's where we get uh, a little complicated. Um, so when I originally was making this drink and, and messing around with it, uh, I wanted to go with a St. Lucia style rum, which it has a certain kind of funk to it, a certain richness to it that is different from the Jamaican style rums, but somewhat complementary to them. Um, they tend to make pot still, tend to do their rums as pot still rums, as opposed to column stills, which tends to lend a little more funkiness to the rums. Um, and so I used Hamilton uh, St. Lucia pot still. However, since that time, um, I've spent a little bit of, uh, of uh, more than a few minutes with the boys over at SNR Liquors in uh, in the district, and uh, they um, they went to Hamilton and they got a, a bottle, excuse me, a cask of Saint Lucian rum bottled for their store. Um, it is aged nine years. It is bottled at cast strength, which means it is 66.7%. Um, so this is a strong rum, but oh my God, is this smooth. For a rum that is that hot, you would expect it to be fiery and burny, and this just isn't. So we are gonna go with a half ounce of this, and here's one of the reasons why nobody else can make this drink, or very few other people can make this drink, is because I think the last time we talked with the guys over at SNR, they were down to three or four bottles of this total, maybe. And that's all there is, that's it. So it's very special rum going into this. All right, a um, couple years back, it was all the craze to use this particular liqueur in every drink you could find. Yes, it is Saint Germain, elderflower liquor, liqueur, sorry. Um, and this is just a, uh, the elderflower is a, it's very botanical, it's very flowery, it's, it's almost perfumey. Um, and this is almost all of the, uh, the sweetness that is gonna go in this cocktail. So we're gonna go three quarters of an ounce of the Saint Germain. I know that seems like a lot, but this is where we get our sweetness from. So we need it to balance out. All right, so there's the Saint Germain. Uh, by the way, you might notice this is not a 750 milliliter bottle. This is a relatively small bottle. I forget uh, how many milliliters this thing is. 200, 200 milliliters. Um, really like the stuff. I like it as an addition to many, many drinks, but wouldn't ever drink it straight. Uh, so the fact that they make it in a 200 milliliter bottle is really nice. So you're not stuck with a great big 750 milliliter bottle. Or you can do like I do and just refill that 200 off the 750 milliliter bottle that I have. All right, next up, 
uh, the thing that gives this some weirdness and just um, bitter funk to it is an Amaro. And we are fortunate in DC that we have Don Chichi Ifili producing Amaros here in the district. That's Amaro de Sarin. And um, Amaros like uh, Campari, Amaro No Nino, uh, Amaro Montenegro, all of these are uh, infused herbal, they have bitter components to them. They work well as a digestive after dinner. They help calm the stomach. Uh, there's just nothing like uh, these, the, the Amaros. Um, Fernet Branca is an Amaro that you'll hear talked about sometimes, uh, very bitter. Um, it just adds a really interesting complex component to this. And it says right on the bottle, traditional bitter liqueur. So you're going to get to some bitterness here, which is, you know, what we want. It's a little bittersweet. Uh, it is powerful stuff. So we're only going to go with a half ounce because we don't want this drink being too bitter. So we've got bitterness, sourness. The sweetness is coming from the St. Germain. We've got some funk and weirdness coming from the, uh, uh, from the St. Lucia pot still. Um, and then we've got one other thing going for us. So I really wanted the mouthfeel of this drink to, to say something about the drink. So it's not just about, oh, that has a nice flavor. It's the elder sign. It should creep you out just a little. So the mouthfeel should be a little unusual. So what we're doing, uh, like uh, most uh, good bars that want to ramp up the thickness or mouthfeel of their cocktails, we are going to use one egg white in this cocktail. Um, and I'm going to be brave here probably stupid and uh, brave. We are going to crack this right over and right in. Do, 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 do. And Kathy and you got a box, uh, their shaker and spoon box this month. Woohoo! Well, this is your name. Oh. So they can put it in a gin and uh, yeah, I know a lot of people that do that, that uh, go ahead and put that in gin and tonic. Um, seems like a plan to me for just a little botanical flavor. Now, the trick here with the uh, with egg whites, um, so use fresh eggs, uh, as fresh as you can get. Um, and uh, you, you don't want them sitting out for too long, something along those lines. I had a couple of eggs in the fridge down here. I got rid of those eggs, brought fresh eggs down for this particular drink. And if you load this up with ice right now, what's going to happen is the ice is going to punch holes in the foam and they're going to make it really difficult to get a really good head on this. So what we're going to do is we're going to do what's called a dry shake. So I'm going to do this, lock this down. Um, be very careful when you're doing dry shakes um, with egg white because as the egg creates foam, um, it expands, right? That's what a foam does. And that creates pressure in the vessel that you are shaking. It is very easy, if you're not being careful, to have this pop open on you. And I have had more than one occasion where I've had to go change my shirt. So we're going to lid this up. Make what sure this is in. Is it just the one room? No, no, no. This is the plantation Jamaican style um, and the Hamilton pot still. This is not. Are much quieter. Yes, but there is, this is not sealing entirely well. Uh, yeah. Because I'm using, um, I'm not using, I'm using a, a a blender tin instead of a mixing tin. So what I should do is this. I'm going to switch so we don't get too messy here. Only partially messy. That'll lit up better. There we go. Dana says he needs to bartend at the next 666. I can do that. All right. There we go. It's got some foam on it. And we're going to add ice cubes to this. Again, if we add crushed ice, we're just going to obliterate the foam. And we don't want to do that. All right. Really messy here.
Now when you're doing an egg foam, you really want to shake the living daylights out of it. And that's why I was doing an extra long shake. And if you get this lidded up right, it's very hard to unseal as well. All right, so this now goes into sunglass. We're going to go with this one. You want to strain this because you don't want the ice in it. Nice and thick. There you go. Can you see that? It looks almost like a, a milk or coconut milk. Um, I would take generally and add some bitters to this. Um, you can add the bitters either for flavor or in this case, uh, kind of for dramatic. dramatic effect. If you get the uh, foam just right and the consistency of this just right, your drops of bitters will just sit on top. And then you can use like a toothpick or something to draw designs with the bitters in the cocktail. Now it's going to be really hard to show any of that. You ready to get seasick? So I'm going to pick up the machine. Mm. So I don't know if you can see that, but there's like little teardrops in the drink. And that, my friends, that is what I call the elder sign. Star, not a big fan because she doesn't like the Amaro element of it. That's definitely an acquired taste. I'm going to try it. She's going to try it again. She's going to see if she likes the uh, likes it with the egg white better than without the egg white. It is better with the egg white. Uh, it comes this is the request from Dave. Uh, so, hmm, a mule. Well, uh, so the problem with doing a mule, Dave, is that I would have to have ginger beer on hand, and I don't actually have ginger beer on hand. Unfortunately, I would I would do it. It's. Uh, but how would you do it? Um, <laughs> New Orleans. Oh, so uh, Tracy is specifying a New Orleans mule. Um, as opposed to a Moscow mule. So the Moscow mule uh, is of course using vodka, hence the name Moscow. Uh, because we're calling this a New Orleans mule, we would be using a liqueur that is particular to New Orleans, or not particular to New Orleans, but uh, is a little more New Orleans-y in style, certainly than vodka. And this would be uh, bourbon uh, in this case, uh, would be what would be used there. Um, you could certainly do a, uh, a mule with uh, with rum, and uh, if what you do is you take your glass and you fill it mostly with uh, ginger beer, uh, a couple of squirts of lime, and then drizzle some Gosling's dark rum over that, um, rather than calling that a rum mule, you would call that a dark and stormy. So there you go. There's that. Um, Ta-da! So that's um, that's two down. Those are extremely different drinks, too, I gotta say. Um, wow, I've got a collection here. I now have three drinks sitting in front of me. Uh, Susie wants someone to make her an older sign. Uh, well, Susie, um, that's gonna be difficult uh, because you need both the Sirene and the, uh, the St. Lucia pot still, um, the overproof, which is next to impossible to get, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm certain I can come up with uh, recommendations for, well, something you can do that is similar to that. Um, I think if you replace the Sirene with Montenegro, which you can get, um, I know out where you are. Um, the pot still uh, St. Lucia is going to be harder to do because this is very specifically an overproof single cast pot still. Um, but they do make, Hamilton does make a St. Lucia pot still, uh, rum. It's just not cask strength. Um, and it's a, a blend of multiple, uh, casks. So you can use that instead. And in fact, that's what I did with the original Sirene, with the original Elder Signs. They're quite, they're quite good. They're just not quite like this. This has got 
just a little backbone to it from the overproof rum that, that makes it better. Uh. Brooks, I shall be right over. <laughs> now, there's a Cajun vodka. I, Maggie says there's a Cajun vodka. I, I don't I, I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, I, Susie I'm, says DC in 2021. Uh, well, so yeah, there is um, there is a world science fiction fantasy convention coming up in the year 2021 that is going to be hosted here in DC. And so if you come over to our place while you're here, they'll make you one. Yeah, there uh, there's we're probably going to have to have an offsite room party <laughs> over here uh, for that uh, for that convention. I am not trucking a bunch of stuff over to the convention hotel. Um, and trying to do something along those lines. Not, not going to happen. Uh, so I'm going to speak from off camera here because I want to show something. So Pooch talked about making a mess. Um, <laughs> something I, 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 something I like to do. Cleans up. So I want to show you a bar mat. And I don't know how well you can see. You can see that there's the little uh, nubby thing. So it's a piece of uh, bar mat. Uh, it's Plastic. Rubber. Uh, rubber, sorry. Um, or it's plastic. rubberized. Yeah. Rubberized. Um, it's, so it has an edge around the end of it. I don't know if you can see that at all. Would it be easier to see on the green one? And, uh, yeah. So here's the green one that I have. Right, you can uh, see the nubbies on that a little better. Yeah. Here, you got that. So you can see that there's an edging to it. Um, so it'll hold things that get spilled on the bar. Um, so it makes cleanup much easier and uh, great investment if, you're, if you've got a spot where you're gonna be doing a lot of cocktails. So, um, how long have we been at this? We, uh, Star, can you give me an estimate? So we've been at this about 40 minutes. Um, so you got one more, right? I've got one more drink that I was lining up to do. Mm -hmm. And this would be unusual. Uh, it'd be something that you've never seen before, using a bar tool that you've never seen me use before. She's going to take my mai tai, leaving me, empty. leaving me with the elder sign. That's okay, because I have another drink over here. Um, you're probably wondering what this is, because I haven't talked about this thing. It's okay. It's just a rum agricole and tonic uh, with a little bit of grenadine in it to sweeten it up just a tad, because. When it's really hot and humid, and it really is hot and humid currently in, uh, in um, I almost said Lawrence, Kansas, <laughs> in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, um, I really like a little bit of tonic, um, and so this works very well for me. I want something different from a gin and tonic. Same proportions as a gin and tonic, um, but in this case made with uh, Clement uh, unaged rum agricole. Asks if there's a Cajun vodka. Oh, she she's asking whether or not there's a Cajun vodka. So, all right. Um, I don't actually have a soapbox here. So here, let me just do this. Here, there. I'm standing on my soapbox. How's that? Um, vodka, vodka by law in the United States um, has to be distilled to an ungodly proof before it can be bottled. Um, it can be distilled from just about anything um, and must be distilled to a neutral flavor. So riddle me this, if you have to distill it to the point where it produces only a neutral flavor, what do we care flavor-wise or who produces it? It's, it's mostly the, the same. Um, so. I, I'm one of these people that's like, eh, vodka, one vodka is very much like another vodka. If the vodka tastes like anything, it's probably not what you want to be drinking. It, now, don't get me wrong, vodka is great for infusing other flavors into it. Um, but it is the tofu of the spirits world. It doesn't taste like anything except what you put it with. There so, is a vodka called Cajun Spirits Distillery Vodka. Cajun Spirits Distillery Vodka, says the off-site web search. Uh, so apparently there is one. Um, so there we go. 
Uh, so yes, apparently there is some sort of New Orleans-y or Creole kind of... Uh, I think it's just a vodka made in Vodka, Orleans. right. Uh, Star says she thinks it's just a vodka made in New Orleans, which you know makes it just like any other vodka made anywhere else in the United States. All right, um, last drink. So um, I'm currently reading a book uh, called uh, Potions of the Caribbean, uh, written by Jeff Beachbum Berry. And uh, he is taking us through the drinks that had their origins in the Caribbean. Um, and uh, one of those drinks that I have just recently come across is something he calls the Voodoo Grog. Um, so the Voodoo Grog, um, yeah, it's the yellow book there. The, the Voodoo Grog is one of those relatively early tiki drink. Here we go, Potions of the Caribbean. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, this one is published through Cocktail Kingdom, which we really like Cocktail Kingdom. They put out really nice stuff, including barware like these jiggers uh, and a few other things that I have lying around here. Um, but it does, it is a blended drink. And in this case, um, I'm not going to use the spindle blender. We're actually going to use a full up normal wearing blender. So that means I'm going to build the drink in here. I know, you've never seen me do it before, um, but we're going to do it. All right, so what do we have here? Uh, so this also takes an egg white. I happen to have another egg here. Dun, dun, dun. Um, part of the reason for doing this is because I always shake my egg drinks. Um, and so I have never done a drink in the blender that uses an egg white. So we're going to find out what this works like and see what it does for the consistency of the drink. So for those of you that are going, oh my God, it's a raw egg or worse, I'm allergic to eggs, pooch, I can't do that. There's an answer for this. Um, so you know those little cans of garbanzo beans? Yeah. So normally when you get a can of garbanzo beans and you want to eat the garbanzo beans for whatever reason, um, you just pour that liquid out or rinse and then rinse them and then pour it out again, rinse it, pour it out again. You're done. Then you have the garbanzo beans. That liquid foams really nicely. So if you pour off that, you have what the bartenders call aquafaba and they use it in equal proportions for uh, what they would normally do for an egg white. And it provides a nice foam. It's uh, vegetarian. So there's, there's no egg in it. So people that are allergic to egg can still have that creamy consistency to their drinks and get a little foam on the drink uh, without causing them to keel over and die. Which, you know, personally, I think that's a good thing in your drinks. Your drinks should not cause you to keel over and die. That should be like rule number one. Drinks should not cause you to keel over and die. All right. But in this case, neither Star nor I are allergic to eggs. We happen to have fresh eggs. So one egg white goes in here. All right, what else are we going to do? We're going to do a half ounce of passion fruit. Here we're going uh, passion fruit puree. Now, Barry calls for passion fruit syrup in this, but uh, he also uses honey in his, and I'm going to use honey syrup in mine. And so as a consequence, I'm going to go with just the passion fruit puree rather than a syrup because I don't want this to get too sweet. So speaking of which, there's a quarter ounce of honey going, honey syrup going in here. So quarter ounce honey syrup, which is going to leak all over the place. Quarter ounce honey syrup. Three quarters ounce of allspice dram. Now, I think I've talked about allspice dram. It's also known as uh, pimento dram. Um, I really, really like Local distillery, Cotton and Reed, I like their allspice dram, but if you don't happen to be local and can't get it from them, um, St. Elizabeth's, St. Elizabeth allspice dram, bottle looks like this, available nationwide, you can get this wherever. So uh, also makes a fine allspice dram, slightly different spice profile. I just happen to like Cotton and Reed. So, you know, since I can give them a plug, I will. So this is three quarters of an ounce. That is a lot of allspice dram. Yep, allspice dram, three quarters of an ounce. 
Okay. Lime juice, because it's tiki drink, right? So there's got to be lime juice in it. Generally true. Uh, three quarters an ounce of lime juice. Lime juice. Shake her up. Bee Brothers makes a bee foam, uh, which is polysorbate 80. Interesting. I mean, I would assume that you can get the same kind of foaming action from various other chemical agents. Uh, I just, uh, the aquafaba and the egg whites are the ones that, that I know. Um, so there you go. Um, we're going to go with one ounce of just a clean white Puerto Rican style rum. And in this case, we're going to go with the tried and true Havana Club. I seal these to keep them from evaporating. And then I can't get the lids off. <laughs> All right, so one ounce of the Havana Club. This is the Havana Club uh, Blanco, right? Yep, and you have Blanco. Uh, one ounce. And then we need something with a little more character to it. And that is wherever I put it. Ah, the Clement. So it requires a rum agricole. Also one ounce. So much like the Mai Tai that we did, this has got a split rum base. In uh, one case, it was a Jamaican and a rum agricole. In this case, we're going with a Puerto Rican style and a rum agricole. All right, that's it. So we've got uh, a rum agricole that's aged, a clean uh, Puerto Rican style rum or Spanish style rum, lime juice, allspice dram, honey syrup, and passion fruit juice. And that looks... I gotta say that that does not look that doesn't look appetizing. It's kind of brown, kind of gloppy because of the egg white. That's kind of nasty looking. Um, so we're gonna throw some crushed ice in here and then we're gonna blend it. And I know I just said when you're shaking drinks, using crushed ice punches all them all the heck and gone, and you don't get a nice foam on them. But I've never done this in the blender before, so we're gonna see what this does. So we'll find out. I, you know, I trust Barry. He says this works, so we're going to go for it. There's some crushed ice. You know, for once, it looks like I am not going to wind up with a ton of leftover crushed ice. Usually I make way too much crushed ice. Oh, well. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to throw a couple of big rock, bigger clumps in here. Martin Kate says uh, adding a couple of larger rocks to blended drinks uh, tends to give them a little better consistency, tends to... Um, the, the crushed ice can develop sort of a just an even consistency, whereas the ice cubes will tend to float up and down in the vortex that gets uh, made up in, in the drink, and so breaks it up a little better. So we're going to try this. And uh, you'll note, I'm remembering to put the top on. You know, when I forget to put the top on, Star doesn't do the cleanup then. She makes me do it because, you know, doofus. <laughs> hey, um, if you've been with me for a while, you've seen me use the spindle blender. And the spindle blender tends to be flash blends. We're talking five to seven seconds. Uh, and that's all it takes uh, to do a flash blend. For this guy... Uh, Barry says like 20 seconds plus, uh, you want to get a good consistency out of this. So here we go. We're going to just flip this guy on. We're going to blend for 20 seconds and hope my motor doesn't burn out. Well, you know, there's 20 seconds or thereabouts by my count. It's very frothy. Oh, that's got a nice smell to it. Oh, it's probably the allspice dram because I love allspice dram. All right, so um, he recommends putting this in a glass tumbler or some other clear tiki mug. So what I thought I would do is use one of these uh, 
sort of clear goblet guys and we're just going to pour this in straight in just lumps up like that yeah star is coming over here because she's like wait that looks like ice cream <laughs> so we're gonna stick a straw in there one straw i gotta say this is not the most appetizing color in the world but you know it's probably fine uh we're gonna stick some mint in here because everything's better with a little old factory addition for with the mint. So we're going to slap that. Right. Um, I happen to have made up uh, a little uh, orange twill here off of an orange peel earlier. And I'm just going to stick that right there. I know there's no orange in this drink. And since I have another orange twill here that is not on it, I'm going to just express a little orange across the top. To give a little bit of a hint of orange to the drink. And then I don't know what this tastes like, so um, I'm going to hand it to Star. <laughs> I also happen to have this, so I can drink out of here. Definitely tasty allspice. <laughs> yeah, I would guess. It's three quarters of an ounce of that puppy in there. Very foamy. That is, um, I mean, it's not quite milkshake. Um, no, it's more like a frothy. Yeah, it's it's like a, if you took an icy and let it sit for a little while and then stirred it up, it's kind of that consistency. So your icy is kind of half melted, kind of half not. Um, it does not taste boozy. It tastes spicy. Yeah. Um, um I mean, there's almost a almost a frappe kind of element to this that uh, you know would, that would be a great if you're taking a uh, tropical trip at Christmas. A tropical trip at Christmas. Okay. So you get that Christmas flavors, but in a nice cool drink. I can also see just uh, pouring this straight up over some uh, uh, some coffee over ice. And making a little frappe out of this. But then again, I like allspice ram in my coffee. So, you know, what, what's my taste? Um, but good. Uh, so there you have it. We did uh, two different takes on the Mai Tai. Uh, we did one custom drink, which is the Elder Sign, which you can get here um, at my place. Uh, hopefully, quarantine will be over by October and we'll actually be able to throw a hunted tiki party, in which case I will make sure that I've got all the ingredients on hand for an elder sign. So you can come by and, and have elder signs from me. And the last, we did a drink that I've never had before, never made before, and that's the Voodoo Grog, circa something, from uh, Beach Bum Berry out of Potions of the Caribbean, and um, circa mid-1950s. There you go. Uh... Beach Bum Berry credits uh, Vic Bergeron, um, who is the creator originator of Trader Vic's uh, with that particular cocktail recipe. So there you go. Um, we are clocking it at uh, just under an hour. I hope you've had fun this last hour watching me sit up here and throw drinks around and throw some alcohol around and get sticky stuff all over my hands and arms and uh, spray it all over the floor down here. Uh, fortunately, we have really good carpet that cleans up nicely, so that's not going to be a problem. Um, so, thank you very much for joining us for another week. This is Lovecraft Cocktails. Um, I think we're going to sign out. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in the comments, and I will get to them and try and uh, answer them in the comments. Um, I think that's it. I think we need someone to come up here and hit the big red button that says, End Live Video.